seat here <laughs> to see me, uh, which is uh, an element of pressure. I'm equally excited to do my first presentation with a clicker in my whole life. Uh, which, you know, we'll see how it goes. And it's been a, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm conscious I'm what separates you from going home or having a drink <laughs> or anything. So I'll keep it, I'll keep it nice and easy, hopefully. Um, despite, the, the, uh, compared to uh, a few of the presentations we've heard today, I have less data and more theory, but we'll see how it goes. So the first bit is usually self-promotion, shamelessly. Uh, this is the sort of result of my work and the sort of starting point of what I'm going to talk about today. It's a, uh, it's a book that sort of tries to, to keep together these four things, like freelance work, platform work, platform economy, co-working, gig economy, and it all started uh, through my PhD work where I worked on, the, uh, on addressing this question. So how does knowledge work change as society becomes digital, or supposedly so? Uh, and the book takes, uh, keeps together a number of projects, including my own PhD work, but also work I've done for a European-funded project called Peer-to-Peer -peer Value, looking at uh, context of common space peer production in a variety of ways, uh, then uh, some work on uh, working spaces, social recruiting, we'll, we'll try to disentangle these terms in a little bit. Um, and uh, the sort of main idea is that uh, compared to the sort of broad discipline on uh, knowledge work and digital labor, we've sort of, the, the main argument there is that we've sort of underestimated the relevance of the concept itself of reputation and what is it about, and the sort of the way in which I unpack this in the book is at the very core of what I'm going to, to show you today as well. One of the aspects that uh, are probably not exactly included in this book, but I think it's uh, worth observing, is uh, how the idea of labor process in the digitization of labor uh, is, is changing. And uh, I have friends who have been uh, working for decades uh, in the theoretical tradition that we know as labor process theory and analysis. And for the, I'm, I'm, I guess most of you are familiar here with, with what we're talking about. If we're not, essentially this is a, a theoretical uh, and also empirical, of course, tradition of, of work, of the sociology, sociology of work, which emerged across the late 1970s and early 1980s to uh, this following the sort of uh, seminal publication of Harry Brickman's book, Labor and Monopoly Capital, uh, to sort of determine uh, labor as a conversion movement. So the idea is that labor, uh, labor process, is what transforms the labor power of workers into a commodity or service that possesses a use of exchange value and that is going to be sold on a market. Uh, this is a, a theoretical tradition that is firmly rooted in the Marxist scholarship. So, uh, but despite so, it has been able over the years to encompass a number of other approaches, uh, including uh, what we will see in a second, the idea of emotional labor, which is a very important idea, came into sociology, which came to sociology through the work of uh, Arlie Oxhill. Uh, anyway, the core proposition of, of labor process analysis and theory is to study the capitalist process of production for which workers, again from a Marxist perspective, are alienated of their labor power to profit means. Uh, now, over the years, however, uh, there has been a sort of slow and reluctant uh, addressing of the digitization of labor by labor process theory and analysis. Uh, the recent debate in the field, in the discipline, has been around subjectivity, mostly, which is something that the bloody Italians have acknowledged mm -hmm. probably 30 or 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea of the missing subject. So at some point they realized, well, you know what, well, probably the role of the subject within the labor process, within this conversion movement, is actually much stronger than we think it was, uh, than we thought it was. Uh, and there has been recent work on that, uh, as well as in a sort of substantially similar line on the way in which we can integrate Ali Oxhill's notion of emotional labor within this very framework and within the idea of the missing subject. So uh, within the labor process and especially the work uh, 
which have or the works which have been looking into the new economy uh, more more recently 2009 uh, there has been the attempt to include this idea of uh, immaterial although they don't like the idea of immaterial labor from from Lazzarato and the Italian theorists but they sort of come the other way around and try to integrate the emotional labor paradigm within their own theoretical framework. Now, I think that uh, this is not enough. So I think that the way in which labor process theory and analysis has been relevant over the 80s and the 90s for the sociology of work deserves more and deserves better than that. Especially deserves a dialogue with the idea of digital labor. Uh, which is something that, uh, of course, perhaps in a sort of oversimplification, I describe as a Marxist orthodox interpretation of uh, work in the digital economy. And, of course, this comes together with uh, the idea of a Marxist autonomist interpretation of uh, work in the digital economy. And it is probably uh, undisputable, in a way, that these two have been the two theoretical streams that better addressed the evolution of work throughout the network society, the new economy, all these big terms that essentially means one thing. Digital technologies and social media have come to be part of work environments, processes of production value, distribution, and organization of labor. And these are the two sort of main theoretical streams that more uh, closely and more effectively have addressed this. Uh, which is quite surprising if, uh, I mean, I'm a sociologist uh, and I keep that definition very strong in me, despite working in a, in a department called Digital Humanities with <laughs> lots of people <laughs> from a variety of fields, but I'm a sociologist. And so the first thing that comes to mind when I talk about work is to look into the sociology of work. And the sociology of work has been looking uh, into a variety of things, but uh, most of them are the role of social capital within these environments. So what uh, happens when we have uh, work relations, as Antonio has explained uh, this morning, that are being uh, flexibilized, so there's less people working in the corporation or firm and more people working out of it as freelancers, collaborators, slaves, whatever you want to call it, that's much, much of the work uh, we used to call the workforce is out of the firm nowadays and increasingly less is within the core and uh, the search of work has looked into this and essentially repeated the same argument all over social capital is what takes you into a job and of course it's unfair because it brings inequalities uh, it brings uh, networks the good old boys networks especially so gender is another issue and we all know that but uh, especially from the specific stream in the sociology of work that we know as labor process, there has been very little work on trying to understand what's going on here. The, for possibly the best uh, one is uh, an edited collection by Alan McKinley and Chris Smith, but it's the, it dates back to 2009, and we all know that since 2009, so many things have changed, and uh, many of the presentations we heard today talk about things that in 2009 didn't exist at all. So uh, that was good, that was awesome, but I think that theoretical tradition needs more. And uh, especially, as I was saying, it needs to dialogue with the idea of digital labor that Antonio has introduced to us this morning. Uh, this was thought of as a sort of a slide to, to sort of touch base on what's the idea of digital labor, and probably now, after your presentation, is not necessary. But the main idea here, uh, and a sort of... Uh, pinch of salt on, on you because you wanted the fight so <laughs> uh, is that built on the idea of free and unpaid labor uh, and that uh, I think that one of the main uh, works in here has been the work by Tiziana Terranova on uh, which, which dates back to 2000 but in a way it read 20 years ahead what was going on uh, the idea that uh, there was a process of uh, value capture through digital media and increasingly from social media a few years ahead perpetrated on users as producers of content uh, in a way through the years this debate kind of got trapped into those who were saying laborers are exploited and uh, producers of content on Facebook are 
uh, are to be remunerated for the work they do, a little bit like you were saying this morning, and other people that were saying, well, this is, of course, in, in the ideal world, this would be fantastic, but it's in, not realistic in actual terms. There's a fantastic uh, uh, article exchange between uh, uh, Christian Fuchs, who was echoed this morning, and my, my professional mentor, Adam Arvidsson, who didn't really like each other over the course of the years through that. <laughs> I'm sort of, just to be clear, taking a step down from that and looking at this objectively. And my reading is that but while we were uh, debating all this, which of course is great in an academic point of view, we were missing the point. The point was things were changing already over the course of the time. And in fact, if we go back and look at what labor process analysis and theory actually are about, we could learn a lot to go and pick from that debate and move on and actually be uh, critical in a uh, comprehensive way of the various process that uh, put workers at risk in many ways and sort of extend the appropriation of capital in uh, the workers' life and time, which is what we are talking about here. Digital technologies as a whole, again, there's a whole literature on that from many angles, but really the bottom line here is that digital technologies as a whole allow more appropriation in exchange of less. So more time devoted to work in exchange of less payment. Whatever payment is that can be little, can be none, you know, many cases, uh, but it, it, there's a sort of trade-off and in place because uh, most of the workers involved into processes of digital media, most social media users, even whether we call them workers or not, do it because they like doing it. And that's a big problem. Uh, but then uh, we have the fact that this theoretical stream um, has a few uh, elements that allow us perhaps to understand more and better what's going on. Uh, and there's people who have argued this repeatedly and that have been repeatedly unheard, like Armin de Berungen, I hope this is the right pronunciation, or Chris Land here. Uh, they were saying essentially, if we look through the eyes of labor process theory and analysis to the actual new economy, they still call it the new economy, it's not longer new, uh, we can actually learn uh, a little bit more. But, as especially Stefan Baum and Chris Land were saying, this needs update. So we need to actually extend the understanding of labor process theory and analysis as such in order to give this theoretical perspective the possibility to understand the very same logics. Now, I propose three aspects to look into this uh, as, a, as a way of changing or actually evolving and building on top of a, of a very successful and very important theoretical perspective. Uh, one of the sort of premises of labor process and analysis is uh, the idea of uh, a point of production where this conversion movement takes place. And I'm very much at, um, at uh, not at ease with this idea considering the context of digital capitalism. The second point, I'll dig into that more extensively one by one in a second. The second point is skills. Braverman's original theoretical proposition is about the degradation of skills. Mm -hmm. Now, what we talk about when we talk about skills today, we heard things uh, also from the various presentations, is slightly different from what we talk about, from what Braverman used to talk about. And third, the very big piece perhaps is that labor process analysis talks about control. So how can we control uh, and managerialize the work of employees to make sure that they actually do that? And now digital media offer fantastic tools to do that and, and get the workers to like being controlled. So we'll see what that means. A few examples, of course, I promise that. Uh, the first point, point of production. What I sort of turn with a non-original, uh, in a non-original way, is that we are witnessing uh, a sort of flexibilization of the point of production. So the point of production, what is the point of production in a digital economy? Is a much less fixed and more mobile one than we used to have in the past. Usually we were 
uh, accustomed that the point of production is a place where a worker who gets up at 7 a.m. in the morning goes into and does stuff that he is told to do by some sort of hierarchical order uh, and then uh, takes place into a very sort of spatially limited environment we used to call a factory, which is no longer the case, actually. Uh, there's a, no longer that relatively set uh, number of participants and there's no longer, at least in an in a explicit way, the hierarchical relationship. When we talk about freelancers, for instance, the knowledge economy, freelancers are theoretically uh, owners of their own means of production, which from a Marxist perspective is quite telling. Uh, because, of course, uh, I, I was reading an article yesterday, I think, or the other day, it was saying uh, self-employment for, for many people used to be the dream, now it's the nightmare, because of course it extends this and not, you know, you're the, your own boss and as you being your own boss, you're actually much harsher than an actual boss. Uh, so we have non-standard employment relationships. Antonio touched base on that this morning. It's large, the gig economy is largely what we used to call a project-based economy, freelance economy, there's people out of the core of, uh, out of the core, uh, structure of uh, a firm organization up the and, and it's no longer a, a, a sort of alternative or niche thing if we think about that uh, in well this is 2015 actually uh, in 2015 the first editorial from the economist was a sort of semi hailing semi worried uh, writing on the on demand economy and how this makes workers on top available on top so uh, I remember Richard Stallman, we spoke about Richard Stallman before, he used to say free as in free speech, not as in free beer. I think mm -hmm. that a metaphor of beer comes back as a sort of reassuring aspect here, because at some point we will have one. And, and we care about all this. Uh, so where, where is the point of production? One of the points of production in the digital economy is co-working spaces. Now, we have seen a few here in this building too which of course have an educational purpose and, and they're you know, very much welcome in, in many ways, but for the actual outside world, co-working spaces mean uh, something that is slightly different from the beauties around here. So co-working spaces are places that freelancers go to hire a desk and spend their day uh, for their own uh, like Wi-Fi, especially Wi-Fi connection. Uh, the idea that they bring uh, opti post options and possibilities for collaboration. They uh, sort of take out the alienation of working from home, which used to be a problem that a lot of literature has highlighted as a big one in the, in the sort of transition to post wordism and digital capitalism. Uh, but the problem is that the, the same literature kind of uh, frames uh, co-working spaces as third places. Third places are places that are not the home, nor the work, neither the home nor the work. Actually, these are workplaces for them. These are workplaces that actually entail a double dimension. So one that actually entails social capital, so relationships with people, uh, and a second dimension that is digital. So people go there because they have a Wi-Fi and they can manage their Twitter feed, they can maintain their website, they can uh, entertain connections on LinkedIn and, and then uh, host people for meetings, because there's a space you can go and do that. So that's an actual point of production, of value at least, for these people. And it's a very particular one, because it's one where there's no boss telling you what to do. There's a host where you, of course, pay a fee to uh, for, for uh, being there, but then it's up to you. But then it's there for uh, uh, the worker to be entrepreneurial, and that should ring a bell. Then we have something I would see also a little bit, online labor markets uh, that are, well, this is a little bit torture, so I'm, I'm actually curious to see what people think about this. In a way, we could see online labor markets as, point, as points of production, at least at the very bottom line of a production of value, because of course, there's a clear value creation process in place within places like Upwork. Uh, these are the last data I could find available. There's a few. Uh, more that I couldn't include in the slide. But the main idea is that it used to be mainstream, it used to be like niche market, around 10%, now it's increasing. 
uh, in various places in the West, particularly, as an option. This work here uh, is, is called the Freelancing in America. It's a big survey uh, that apparently uh, argues that there are around 50 million freelance workers uh, or people engaged in freelance gigs in 2015. There's a typology in that which I really uh, wish you could, well, I really encourage you to go and look into. There's a variety of types of freelancers that have been listed within that. Uh, there's, there's a sort of classical freelancer, there's the, uh, the freelance business owners or freelancers who outsource work uh, to uh, others. And there's a nice uh, type, uh, an ideal type in a way for freelancers, which is the moonlighter. The moonlighter is a person who has a job and goes back home and works at night on, on these sorts of platforms. Uh, in a way, these are points of production, and we'll see that there's more problems with that. Uh, one of the problems that, we, in, in part of my PhD, I had the chance to interview the, what used to be the vice president of Elance, which is one of the companies that make up work. The other one is Odesk, which used to be French-based, uh, I understand. Uh, now they're sort of merged together, and it was like, uh, so I, we asked him, what do you think about the fact that women earn less in normal labor markets than, than men? Because that's a fact, unfortunately. And he was like, no, that's not for us. That's, we, we are very equal with that. And how, what do you, you know, put in place in order to make sure that you know, there's a fair pay between men and, and women? And he didn't answer. So again, there's a lot of elements of concerns. But still, we're talking about a point of production, I, I believe. A point of production that we're linking into skills picks up and raises the question of what is produced inside there. Now, uh, if we look at uh, critical media theory, there's a clear idea of what's going on in these sorts of networked hubs uh, in terms of what is produced. What is produced is social relations. They are produced. What is produced there is network connections. Uh, is to Sort of go back to the main, to the start of my talk, is reputations. So that's what links these people, people working into co-working spaces, into jobs. The idea that you have a reputation in a professional scene and that brings you contacts that will then get on to give you some sort of job. This is, we are talking about an offline setting, but we'll see that there's a clear analogy with online labor markets where reputation algorithms actually do the job for you and are able to make uh, visible a ranking and a system of feedback and reviews that make sure that this work is equally done. They're actually analogous. They have the same function. And this is something that over the years, especially at two moments in time, uh, critical media theory has a frame with the idea of network sociality by Andreas Wittel, uh, and uh, more recently by Melissa Gregg, when she talked about the friending for labor and the compulsory necessity for workers to socialize. Uh, as uh, my own humble addition, I say that this is a performative work. So this is not simply social relations and then work. This is work. That's my sort of clear statement, which is something they don't really say. Well, they say that's uh, job address. Yeah, yeah, we, we discussed that. And it was like, yeah, I should have made it clear, but you know. Fair enough, that's, that's pretty much in line with, with what they say. I'm not disagreeing at all. Oh. Skills. Oh. Here we go. <laughs> On top of this, as we, you know, we observe, and, and actually there's, there's uh, emerging empirical data on co-working spaces that say that people go into co-working spaces, but they don't really care about what surrounds around them. They only care about getting contacts and potential collaborations out of it. So that's not a community, a co-working space is not a community. There's a very big buzzword around co-working spaces as communitarian. They're not communitarian. People are very transactional, more than communitarian within co-working spaces. So on top of this, one may argue that uh, the very idea of skills changes and the uh, sort of uh, idea that Braverman put along, put forward, that's the idea of uh, the degradation of workers. So sort of labor process brings workers towards a degradation of their skills. The more workers uh, lower their skills, the more we, we capitalists earn about that. 
But actually, it's no longer the case in many contexts. I mean, knowledge economies, media industries, digital workers operate in labor markets that reifies the, the upskilling of workers. So if you go and uh, uh, talk about uh, that with employers, who, what, what do we want from a graduate? They want this, this, and that. They want highly skilled graduates. Those who enter the job market, look at the data from the UK. I, that's the one I know a little bit better from this year, from the Department of Creative Industries and uh, something else. Uh, they say that, uh, oh dear, uh, they say that uh, essentially there's a, a clear uh, necessity of highly skilled workers. This means that workers, the, the, the job market is flat, they're all highly skilled. So the main skill for them is getting contacts. Networking is their main eye and probably only skill. And digital media serve this logic. Digital media management, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, they're, they're doing this for them. And of course this is analogous to what happens on platforms uh, where we have skills that are summed up into uh, a nice layout which looks a lot like Facebook although it's green and uh, there's, a, there's work history and feedback it used to be uh, with Elance it used to be framed in an actual number which was a scary ranking you were as good as nine say which was tricky uh, but that's the sort of if, if you look at the I, I, in my PhD I look at the number of Elance profiles and pretty much 29 over 60 of them were having the same skills display and uh, the majority of them didn't have a CV uploaded on it. So they didn't really care about showing that they have a degree from Central St. Martin School of Art. What they care about is the bloody feedback. It's the only thing that matters. So the process of reputation management is offline and online. And if you look at the way in which employers use social media, it's fairly analogous. Uh, more than half of the recruitment activity is now uh, involving the internet and uh, basically the main filtering employers do is by going on your Facebook page. That's when I tell my students the faces go pale and they say, oh dear, then I have to cancel a lot of pictures, especially of my Saturday nights. Mm -hmm. And they just, you know, what the sort of filtering the process that takes place through uh, looking at social media mainly. So the main logic and the main takeaway from this is that employers develop an idea of a reputation of a worker on the basis of what they find online. And this is, of course applies to job seeking, but I'll skip that because it's, uh, it's too late. Uh, does it work? Yes and no. Of course we have tricky bits in that. Uh, for instance, this one in the middle, one third of recruiters in, in the study I'm, I'm quoting uh, that has been done by uh, an Italian professor called Ivana Pais, admit that they have rejected a potential candidate as a consequence of what they found online, which is a pretty high figure, um, and they check the connections that people have. For instance, they go on LinkedIn and they have assess whether they are into the industry on the basis of those they are connected. Finally, managerialization of control. So. Uh, this brings to argue that workers are, if workers are no longer excluded from up improving their skills, there's a way we can de-skill them, which is by calculating their performance using a Fitbit. Uh, perhaps this is what happens to delivery guys in a variety of contexts. There's an article from, uh, which is in New Media and Society by a lady called Finney Moore, that, uh, and, and, and together with and, uh, Andrew Robinson, I think it's the name, uh, that uh, shows and uh, tells about how uh, Tesco delivery people, Tesco is a big uh, chain supermarket in the UK, uh, are uh, evaluated in their uh, uh, work performance on the basis of the GDS position that they are found and the sort of capacity they have to go from point A to point B as quickly as they can, which is scary, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll skip that. Um, so the main idea, and I'll, and I'll end with that, is that Two minutes, no one, two, please. Uh, what we see here is that reputation emerges as in an ecology where it is conceived as value. It's a conception of value for both the, 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 what we used to call demand and we used to call supply. And uh, why reputation and not other contexts? Well, because reputation is a financial element. Reputation is a very financial aspect that if you go back to 
the idea of trust by a sociologist called Niklas Luhmann is what essentially intermediates trust with risk. And risk is a very big financial concept too. So embarking on hiring a worker, not temporarily but permanently, is a risk for companies and the reputation that workers are able to display on social media are, is actually an element that uh, allows to reduce the risk and uh, there's a lot of dystopian consequences that I wanted to share with you uh, based on Antonio's talk, but I don't have time to do. Maybe we can do it later. Uh, the idea is that reputation is the element that allows people to trust each other in a context where they're quasi strangers. This happens within co-working spaces as well as within uh, online environments like online labor markets and is a strong element of control. So we need a digital labor process analysis, which means that takes this sentence here from Braverman, because it was there, a bit more seriously. So the idea that we are using social media, digital media, algorithms and whatnots as elements that codify work relations is rules of performance. And probably these guys have something to say, the labor process literature has something to say that has not yet been said about this and sort of put, could perhaps be the meeting place between those who have thought a lot over the last decades about whether digital labor as exploitation is actually something like we should pay workers and Facebook content producers or it is unrealistic. Maybe it's just a codification of rules of performance. Maybe we need to think about this and, and you know, actually labor process could help us in understanding the evolution of this conversion movement as we have now a digital media work ecology. Thanks. Sorry, I'm slightly longer. No, 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 thank you very much. Questions? Uh, I Ooh. have one. Would you like to start? Oh, no, please, please. I, uh, um, <laughs> thank you very much for your presentation. I will mean, share your opinion about uh, how the labor, also, that the labor process theory can help us better understand the thing, but uh, at some point of your presentation, I was wondering whether you speak about digital labor or knowledge work. Well, I mean, probably I didn't make it clear enough at the very beginning. I take uh, uh, knowledge work in a sort of broad context where I locate a lot of the stuff that has been discussed this morning. I mm. think I'm pretty much, if you look at the very you know original definition of knowledge work by Peter Drucker every sort of activity that we've seen today from uh, the crowdsourcing aspects to the mechanical turkers even though it involves clicking and a you know, very okay. particular mechanical activity can be taken together within okay. the knowledge work framework and, and that's why I don't like when people talk about this and say oh you're talking about the creative economy well even then more than that because uh, a mechanical turker is not a creative activity but they have very similar logics but maybe in some minds, uh, knowledge work implies highly skilled workers. So yeah. that, that's why it's quite ambiguous. And just one more uh, sure. comment. Uh, when you talk about the part of production, um, I was surprised that you don't generalize the thing that, for me, the point of production is more the platform, which is with the algorithm, more than the co-working spaces. So um, maybe I'm wrong, but that was my thought about this. Way of yeah, the, well, the theorizing. idea, again, probably I explained it uh, in, a, in a relatively quick way, so that wasn't clear enough. So the idea is to, again, try and draw an analogy. There's a lot of people, for instance, coming from the digital media world that say, you know, the online and then the offline, and in, sort of implying that the online is not real, and it's virtual, and the offline is not, I mean, the actual no, real yeah. is the offline. So I think there's a contiguity in what I tried to say is okay. to sort of see the similarity between the two uh, because there's a clear line of analogy, I think, in between the ways in which working are, workers are working on platforms and workers are working on co-working spaces. Uh, I can, it can, can be longer than that, but I'm, I'm not sure if that's appropriate. But the main idea in a, in a nutshell is that a co-working space is a platform, is a coordinator, is a place where you go and you have social relationships at place and tasks take place in a similar way, but it's physical. It's an aggregator of social relations, in a way. Can you 
can be for yeah it's it can studies. be it can be it can be okay in many okay. cases it is if you look mm -hmm. at some of the data that are starting to emerge mm -hmm. from from that uh, but of course it can not all of them are thank you I probably return in the favor by uh, allowing you to develop on the okay. generalization of control. <laughs> but I, I, I want to do it uh, in a more subtle way by right. uh, actually challenging the part about skills. And I, uh, I, I just want to say from the beginning uh, that uh, I have very mixed feelings myself about the hypothesis of this skilling. Because in a way, we can probably uh, recognize, I mean, the sociology of work has been, recon has been recognized for, for decades now that there is always one way uh, uh, of, uh, I mean, that, that, that the workers have to create new skills around uh, effective processes of this skilling, mm -hmm. okay? Like, for instance, okay, you force me to a discipline of, you know, turning uh, or pounding nails, but I develop my own mini skill around pounding nail in a specific way, which is, you know. So my point could be, uh, are we talking about, are you talking about skills, or are you talking about competencies interpreted as declarative skills and very homogenized at them? Because, I mean, the kind of examples that you point towards like in Upwork, the kind of being good at, I don't know, data analysis or whatever, any other thing, it doesn't sound like skills to me. It sounds like competencies. And the difference being that skills is something that is usually more humble and sometimes more disruptive and even subversive in a way. Like a, a, a worker that develops a skill to work faster or to, in some case, actually work against the the, the labor process. It is a skill. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, in so, and, and what's the what's the relation with manage, managerialization of control in this case? Yeah. Well, I think that the, the bottom line for me was to try and distinguish what we sort of think as uh, uh, sort of standard skills, like having a certain education title. There's a lot. For instance, employers looking uh, come from from that uh, to that thought from the perspective of what an employer thinks is a skill. And a skill for an employer is having a certain education title. An highly skilled worker is generally a graduate who can manage different computer programs, for instance. So that is a sort of probably naive way of approaching the term skill and sort of distinguishing, on the one hand, highly skilled from low skilled occupations, uh, and on the other hand, the sort of hard versus soft skills. Uh, and uh, because of one of the sort of implicits in there is that we always thought. Uh, of networking as a soft skill. In fact, it's very much a tangible one nowadays because we go on LinkedIn and we see the connections. So it's visible, it's tangible. Uh, but I can see that's a, that's, a, that's a point I can explain better perhaps in the written format and thanks for that, I'll, I'll take it on board because uh, the, main, the main point actually in links to the idea of control is that uh, when you go and do, the, for instance, the example of the filtering through the CVs uh, in, a, in a job application that recruiters do by going online, that's an element of control, I think, because it's a preventive sort of, you, you, you know, even before you get into the job, mm -hmm. you are sort of subjected to forms of control because you think, no, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to post this picture of uh, Donald Trump on Twitter because I'm, I'm going to look crazy as his. But is this qualitatively different than being screened on at an interview? Sorry, say it again. How is that qualitatively different from being screened at an interview? The what what um, I spoke to this about this with the recruiter, and he says that basically it's uh, uh, quicker because it gives the chance to sort of screen faster and get rid of the spam. No, I see that it's practically different and probably it's a very good strategy to use because I'm sure... For them, for sure. I'm sure pictures do predict uh, something. Um, but probably in a, in, a, in a deep level, no, there's no big difference. In a way, if, in a way it's sort of... The point here being is that it sort of puts the pressure even before you actually do the application. Mm -hmm. It gives... It, it subjects you to the logics yeah. of uh, a management of an online image that is 
suitable for an employer and not because you like posting a, cat, a picture of a cat or, well, maybe Donald Trump, you shouldn't do it, but, uh, you know, it's not your own personal decision on how you subject your own choices to social media. It's actually, in the back of your mind, an element of control that says, no, I'm not going to put this up because then if some employer will find it, then he's going to, or she's going to delete my The reputation management has been going on, I guess, for decades, way yeah. before the internet. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying.